part four of 3.0, chapter 3.0, Through the Hacker's Lens, we're going to dive deeper into threats, vulnerabilities, and attacks. So let's just jump right into the material. All right, so we're going to differentiate between threats, vulnerabilities, and attacks, continue our previous conversation in part three, in part four. So let's look at some specifics of threats, diving deeper into threats, right? So we now know generally what a threat is. Let's look at types of threats, starting with an adverse event. So, you know, this is really anything, right? That causes negative consequences like system crashes, malicious code, you know, take it outside of the digital realm. You know, what's what's the risk of an adverse event where somebody breaks into the company, steals a server, steals backups, whatever the case may be, right? Hopefully those backups are encrypted. So Snowflake example is facing a DDoS attack. We'll talk about what that is, a distributed denial of service attack that overwhelmed the central web server. So botnet attacks, boom. What do we do to mitigate? We implement DDoS protection and traffic filtering measures. So again, right, dynamically stopping those IP addresses that are sourced with the bots that are attacking the network, or in this case, the web servers, right? A breach is any unauthorized access to personal identifiable information. Um, it doesn't just have to be personal identifiable information. That's an example, right? This can be company proprietary data, databases, you name it. You know, pretty much any unauthorized access, period, okay, is a breach. And a breach can, again, happen at that physical level. Somebody breaks in, somebody gets into an area uh, where only authorized personnel and does some damage, right? They've breached that perimeter, if you will. So our snowflake example is a former IT employee, i.e. an insider threat, right? A sex um, accessing and exfiltrating customer data. So former meaning they've left the company, somebody messed up, should have shut off their, their credentials, right? Made sure if it was an IT person, they didn't have a back door. Of course they did. The person breaches the system, steals the data, right? So mitigation, revoking access rights immediately. I have a couple stories around that as well. I have a story where an individual was let go from a company. He, um, before being let go, we were not notified. We did not cancel. He was allowed to go back to his desk. He logged onto the computer and deleted about six months worth of project data that he was leading the project for, okay? Luckily, as the IT department, we had a backup. We were able to restore that data. Had we not, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars of a new project and six months of time, payroll benefits that would have been lost. So mitigation, again, revoking those access rights immediately. IT should be made aware of people being let go before they're made aware, okay? And that's why we try to keep these things also quiet. You know, we may write up an employee once or twice, but when it comes to terminating them, hopefully we can do it in a timely manner that they don't see it coming. It doesn't give them time to go from an honest employee to an insider threat. Intrusions, unauthorized access to system resources. So Snowflake, an unknown attacker, exploited a VPN vulnerability to access the internal network. Again, we see patching. We're gonna see a lot of the same best practices to mitigate these threats, right? Or reduce the risk or reduce the threat vector around these threats. Spoofing. Faking sending addresses to gain a legal entry. So the CFO received a spoofed email appearing to be from the CEO. Now this really doesn't do it well um, as it pertains to spoofing. That would be more phishing, right? Um, spoofing would be we're going to spoof an IP address. That's what they're talking about and send traffic as if it looks legitimate, right? We talked about IP address filtering. Well, 
if we've got IP addresses that are on a whitelist and somebody spoofs that address, they could potentially gain access to the system, right? So again, from a phishing standpoint, implementing email filtering, get ri getting rid of those common blacklisted email addresses, domains, et cetera. Um, having an email filter that is up to date on trends, right? Zero day threats, by now you know a little bit about those. It's exploiting an unknown vulnerability, vulnerability without detection. If you read um, Nicole's book, so this is how they tell me the world will end, you will learn about zero days. You'll learn that there's an entire market okay, of zero days where hackers can sell zero days sometimes for you know millions and millions of dollars because they're so valuable from you know a means of having a way to to manipulate a system through again a vulnerability in the software right so in the case of snowflake targeted with zero day attack on their crm system so basically their customer relationship management system had a flaw it was a zero day flaw meaning someone could inject code or modify code or use that vulnerability to gain access to other systems right so collaborating with software vendors for timely patching there it is again using anomaly detection systems etc just a little bit more on the advanced persistent threat we already know it's a prolonged and targeted attack often nation state sponsored okay so we get into a system we go deeper into the system we gain more access we gain more control we find other vulnerabilities we're able to identify versions of operating systems that may be vulnerable sql databases that may be vulnerable web apps you know those are those are common targets in the way of software and malicious um, software okay example for snowflake Detecting uh, unusual network activity, indicating an advanced persistent threat. So maybe they've got command and control and we're monitoring that outbound traffic and we see some outbound traffic from an IP address and port that we're not used to seeing that traffic, okay? Mitigating, implementing advanced threat detection tools, isolating critical systems, you know, separating them with, you know, VLANing, whatever the case may be. Finally, ransomware. So, you know, locking screens or files until a ransom is paid. And boy, have I given you example after example after example of this. Um, you know, do a little research on the real snowflake. See what's going on with their customers. That's all I can say, right? Um, snowflake... In, our snowflake encountering a ransom attack encrypting critical business data you know this may may have come simply from who where is that attack vector usually start with the end user who's been trained who should know better as you might say to click on something that's too good to be true download that software and off we go right and then a vulnerability within an operating system that is yet to be patched by IT Boom, there's our mechanism for encryption and we start encrypting systems. So we can, by the way, restore data. The challenge is data is getting so large in size that restoring can take days, it can take months, all the different systems. Think about, take this down to your house. Think about just the IT systems in your house your TVs, your printer, maybe your thermostat, your computer that you use every day, your Wi-Fi network, your wired network, your car, right? What else could you add to that? What else is automated in your house that creates an attack vector for a hacker, okay? Or, you know, a, a malicious um, threat to do what it is that they do. So viruses, let's switch gears. Let's talk about malware. So when we talk about malware, the general term is virus, all right? Attaching to a host program, spreading through user interaction, a virus spreading through email attachments and causing significant data. Of course, we would wanna keep that from happening, right? 
again, antivirus, e e email filters, you name it. Worms are a virus. They're a specific type of virus that self-replicates, right? So that Morris worm that we talked about was written to self-replicate itself onto a network. Snowflake's example is a worm exploiting an unpatched email client vulnerability, maybe an Outlook. It takes advantage of that. It spreads across the network. It hits the next person's Outlook, the next person you get where this is going. And pretty soon our network is full of worms that have whatever payload or are doing whatever they're doing. And of course, we're back to patching. So I kind of like, you know, all of these images, by the way, are created by AI, by ChatGPT for the most part. I give it a detailed description. I think it's coming up with some amazing stuff. And each day I use it for this video series, the better it gets. So what is a Trojan horse? Take us back to Roman days. Disguised programs, in the case of software, you know, hiding malicious functionality. So we've got that zero day. We take advantage of that zero day. We create malicious software. We inject it in. Boom, we have maybe that back door, right? So in this case, example for Snowflake, an employee installing a Trojan uh, disguised as a software update. So mitigation, implementing software verification processes, and user training. So spyware, <laughs> kind of did a little spy versus spy thing going on here. Secretly collecting information about end users. Now we get this when we download that software, that free software that is not necessarily free, right? Um, I'm constantly getting calls and, you know, helping end users who don't realize they should have virus protection on their phone because on their phone, they're clicking on those links. Spyware is getting in there. It's collecting that data. It's downloading additional games that they didn't ask for, whatever the case may be, right? But in the case of spyware, it's about tracking that user. Where are they going? How long are they get there? What are they looking at? We give that back to advertising agencies you know, or companies, and they then know who their target audience is, right? So in the case of Snowflake, discovering spyware, um, logging keystrokes, and capturing screenshots in this case. So that's really a deep spyware, if you will, okay? And what's interesting is Microsoft, through AI, was looking to do some of this. I don't remember the name of what they called it, but boy, have there been... <laughs> It's like, wait a minute, Microsoft, this is spyware. Anyway, bots, botnets, kind of put together what is a bot? So re remotely control malicious code used for large scales attacks. That's a botnet. A singular node of a botnet is a bot. That can be a computer, right, that has been taken over. It might be IoT devices. So recently there was a large botnet found that took over home routers that weren't updated. So what does that tell us? Don't forget to update your home router, your Wi-Fi router, okay? Update those a lot. Make sure if it's your ISP that's, that's giving that to you, make sure they're updating it as well. So mitigation, you know, at a large scale for corporations, implementing intrusion detection systems, you know, isolating infected devices, figuring out, looking at that traffic, that you know, abnormal traffic from within the website. So a payload, a little bit about a payload. You know, by the way, keep in mind, these are not just a specific generation of people that are threat actors, you know, as given here. Okay, an example here. So, uh, a payload is that part of the malware that performs the malicious activity like the data threat, like you know the screen captures, like the keystrokes. So that's what the payload is. What is it that the malicious software does, right? Payload of ransomware is the encryption of the data, right? So in the example of Snowflake, malware designed to steal confidential financial data was the payload in one you know attack that they experienced so there's your mitigation uh, as well so how do we analyze this malware so in order to figure out how to protect against these malwares 
Antivirus companies, for example, have to analyze the malware and there's two ways to do it that you need to know and that is static analysis or dynamic analysis. So static is just examining the code itself, right? Figuring out what the code does without implementing the malware, without executing the malware, okay? Now the other type is dynamic where we actually observe the, the malware behavior. So we execute the malware, we see which parts of the system it's taking advantage of, how it's doing it, what its ultimate job is. Usually the two are done together, okay? Keep that in mind. You know, but we need to, in order to protect things, we need to know how it's going to impact it, okay? So again, dynamic is observing, static is reading the code, okay? The Snowflake example, using tools like uh, Intrusion Detect Ida Pro or Cuckoo Sandbox, I almost said <laughs> Cuckoo Sandbox for malware analysis. So those are two standardized, well-known malware analysis tools that are used, right? Conducting both static and dynamic analysis to understand and defend against malware. Now, maybe large, large organizations have their own analysis team as part of their SOC, okay? But small businesses, they rely on the antivirus. They rely on Windows Defender to do that. All right, so we are done with part four. We're almost done with chapter three in part five we are gonna take a look at continuing this and look at attacks. We're gonna focus on the attack itself. I look forward to seeing you or having you watch the next video. Take care.